Welcome, everybody. Um, whether you're here in the room or whether you're online, in more ways than one, a very warm, incredibly warm welcome to this space. Friends, I want to introduce you to our esteemed visitor, but allow me as well just to make a, a press the pause button and say this, every one of you is here because of suicide. Many of you are here because of a suicide, all right? If that's your story, I want to say from my heart to yours, a particular thank you because it is your living and lived experience and the stories that you hold in your heart, your journey and the journey and story of the person that you may have lost, which must be at the heart of all our endeavor in writing <laughs> suicide together as leaders in this field. I wanted to share with you a word about papyrus if I may, or rather three words. If you ask any of our staff, trustees, or volunteers, how do we prevent young suicide? They should say these three words. Firstly, we support, and mainly that's through our Hopeline UK service. The number is in front of me. Every day, we listen to stories of children, children, children who are considering suicide right now young people young adults and those who care for them who are often left parenting in the dark as it were i would give them advice and support hoping to enkindle in them that hope which for now has been hidden through texts emails telephone calls web chat all of those connections are with people who are experiencing suicidality right now and engaging sometimes in behaviours which will lead to harm or death. Our trustees, most of whom have lost a child to suicide, are very keen to maintain our position in terms of our intervention policy. We will make no apology for sharing information to keep young person safe from suicide. Most often we don't need to share information outside that call because the young person is the protagonist of saving their life. We just have the privilege to support that endeavor. Often we will intervene and get blue light services and others involved to make suicide safety. Information sharing is really important as we know and I hope will continue to be a, a huge sort of golden thread throughout any suicide prevention strategy. But we speak daily to professionals as well, people who have young people in their care. We do a debriefing service and all of that is part of our support. If you're worried about how to have a conversation, pick up the phone and talk to us and we'll support you in that. If you've had a very challenging conversation with a young person, you just want to talk to somebody else, say, well done, pick up the phone and talk to us. It's a very well-used service, that deep weekend at the Hope Mind service, and I'm very proud of it. So the first word is support. The second is equip, as I speak, dozens of our staff are out representing this wonderful charity that I'm privileged to be the chief executive of. In communities like the ones you've traveled from today, I have to pay credit, sorry people online, to the people who were able to get here. Rumor has it that at least two dads have walked here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the support we have from our various people around the country, many of whom have lost a child to suicide, is just incredible. But it enables those people right now to be out in colleges, in schools, 
in education establishments, on the street, working alongside the big issue colleagues, in universities, in community groups, online, with LGBT communities, with traveler communities, the list goes on, job centres, festivals. Thank goodness you came here and not Glastonbury. <laughs> I'm very proud of all that equipping. When I got this job 12 years ago, our late chair of trustees, Anne Parry, who I have to share this, would be very proud today to see what's happening. Said this to me. If you do nothing else, Jed, make sure you get bloody angry. I think that's when I'll say at the heart of our work is the third word, influence. We don't have a monopoly of that, we want that. This is our core strategy, support, equip, and influence. We do that in many ways. A casual conversation with a friend in a pub. Encourages somebody who's lost a child to come and walk with us in more ways than one. I will stop talking about the three dads in there, okay? <laughs> it might be a hard-hitting film which challenges the internet industries to do their part to keep young people safe online. It might be you pull up behind a bus and read the results of an exam paper, physics D, English E, maths A, Religion D, and that dead word, the message, this could be you, call our help man, don't let it be. That's how we influence too. But like all of the people sitting in front of me on and offline who share in that goal of influencing, as Steve Mullen said earlier today, speaking truth to power, and that doesn't just mean to politicians. Speaking our, the truth to our power, recognizing that we're leaders and we need to challenge our power as well, is how we each influence young people and those who care for them to say there is always hope. That young people are more likely to die by suicide in our country today, more than road accidents, more than heart disease, more than cancer or any other disease, is a national scandal. And a tragedy that demands all our best thinking. That the rate and number of suicides in teenage children and young people has gone year on year up and up. It's something that we shouldn't rest until we can answer the question why. But enough from me, it's the influence as a sector, not just as virus, of course, that collectively enables me today to welcome again online, I hope, the suicide prevention minister, Julian Keegan, who many of you have met already, I'm sure. Julian, if you can see and hear us, you're very welcome today. But that same influence today enables the virus enables me on your behalf to say these words. Please welcome the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, the Right Honourable Sergeant Javid, Minister Morgan. Last Monday would have been my brother Tarek's birthday. I say would have been because Tarek is no longer with us. He took his own life. And on that Monday, it was the first thing that I thought about when I opened my eyes and the last thing I talked about when I closed my eyes. Nothing can prepare you for the loss of a loved one. But I want to use this privileged role that I have as the Secretary of State to do right by his memory <coughs> and also the memory of thousands of others who each year have left us before their time, by preventing more people from going down the same devastating path. Almost everyone in this country 
has been touched by suicide in some way. The Samaritans doing amazing work. The Samaritans answer a call for help every 10 seconds. And tragically, around every 90 minutes, someone dies from suicide in the UK. And when we look across the last decade, and we look at government initiatives, like the previous suicide prevention strategy, no matter how well intentioned, the trends have broadly been going in the wrong direction. We must treat suicides with the same urgency that we treat any other major killer and take determined action that reflects the changes and the progress that we all want to see in society. So we will be publishing a, a new 10 year mental health plan and all at the moment we've got a call for evidence asking for people's views and shortly after that we will be publishing a new 10 year suicide prevention plan. I want to hear views from far and wide to help us to shape this work. And the round table I chaired this morning was so illuminating in helping me do just that. I heard heartbreaking tales of love and of loss, but I also heard inspirational stories of the work that's being done to divert people from this painful path, including of course, the work of Papyrus here. I'm determined to make a difference on this issue. And I wanted to talk, take this opportunity to come and speak to you all and talk about some of the principles that will drive this future work. The first is encouraging those people who are at the greatest, who are the greatest risk to come forward and to get the help that they need. Talking about our innermost feelings can be uncomfortable and upsetting, of course. But it is so important. I am 52 years old, the same age that Tarek was when he left us. Men in their 40s and 50s, they make up a disproportionately high proportion of male suicides, around, I think, around 40%. We can achieve so much if we encourage people to talk about how they feel and then they come forward and ask for help. Thanks to the trailblazing blazing courage of campaigners in the public eye and thousands of quiet conversations in homes and schools and workplaces, more and more people across the country are being open about their mental health. We must keep these conversations going as we did with COVID and look at how we can bring people, groups of people together, traditionally more reluctant to come forward. Last week, there was a, a survey that I heard about that published uh, it was showing that some 75% of construction workers said that they regularly discussed their emotions with their colleagues. 75% said that they didn't go. But yet there were some people who derided them for this. There are some newspapers that said that this is evidence of a, a, a stereotypically male-dominated profession losing its way. That's what some people said. You know, I found that data shocking as well, because I wanted to be 100%, not 75%, because too many people suffer in silence based on outdated ideas of what it means to be a man. Mental health must not only be talked about in whispers, we must shout about it, because keeping quiet can kill. Traditionally, the construction trade has a suicide rate that is three times higher than the national male average rate. And so the fact that people who work are talking more is a cause for celebration, not castigation. And to build this progress, I want to see more local areas doing outreach activities in places that men are likely to attend. You know, I've heard of wonderful stories of in, in Thailand and where, where there's a gym that gives men a safe space to share their feelings. There's a group of barbers that I've heard about who are trained to recognize symptoms of mental ill health. And there's a talk club, it's called Talk Club, I think, where a talking and listening group has been established that's being hosted by football clubs and their supporters. So we know from all the research that's already out there, that it's easier to talk about your feelings 
when you're pursuing your passion. When we recently awarded over five billion pounds of funding to the voluntary sector as part of our suicide prevention grant, we backed a number of organizations that work specifically with men. As we take forward our plans for suicide prevention, we will also keep focusing on those communities where suicide is the greatest risk. So for instance, the LGBT community, which makes up a third of people who access a, 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 a organization called SHAT, the Suicide Prevention Hotline. This work goes hand in hand with our mission to tackle disparities across the country and to transform local communities. Men in the lowest social economic groups who live in the, some of the most deprived areas in our country, they are up to 10 times more at risk of suicide than those in the highest socioeconomic groups, in other words, those living in the most affluent areas. There are regional disparities too. For instance, you are twice as likely, twice as likely to die in the Northeast by suicide than you are in London. It's fantastic that we have charities from across the UK that are here today. Many that I met in the, in the round table that we just had. And my department is working with many of you here today to get to the bottom of these disparities and to work out how we can try and put them right. One of the golden threads that are running through all my work in this role has been the commitment to tackle disparities of all kinds that have been overlooked and I think ignored for far too long. A relentless focus on suicide prevention will help us to break the cycle of devastation and deprivation in some of our most deprived communities. And so too, focusing on transforming communities can lift so many of the strains on our health and happiness. What the economist and Nobel Prize winner, Sir Angus Deaton, recently he's called the deaths of despair that sit behind so many of the tragic stories in our country. As well as looking at those communities at greatest risk, we must also look at the risk factors that lead to suicides across all communities. And this is the second area of what I wanted to talk about today. We know that the causes of suicide are complex and they're intertwined, but the data does show that there are some areas where we can have a big impact. For example, there's a, a project in Kent that found that 30% of all suspected suicides in a two year period were linked to domestic abuse. Our new plan will look at risks like domestic abuse and risks like gambling. These weren't, by the way, both of these, they were not looked at in the previous strategy. It will also place a greater focus on the online world, which has created new challenges when it comes to suicide prevention. Now we've made some real progress in some areas, like working with manufacturers and online platforms to limit access to methods of suicide online. But there are also areas where we found it harder to keep up with the proliferation of digital content. For example, when it comes to pro-suicide related content. Research has already found that suicide related internet use in the cases over uh, in cases over a quarter of suicide deaths in those let me say that again research has found that suicide related internet use was relevant to over a quarter of suicide deaths for those that were aged under 20. and google searches for suicide methods for uk browsers have risen by over 50 percent in two years Think about that. When we use the internet, we almost all use Google, and the searches for suicide methods for you in, in the UK has gone up by more than 50% in two years. You know, just over two years ago, when I was the Home Secretary, I spoke at the launch of the online harms white paper. And I've talked about how we cannot allow leaders of some of the big tech companies to simply look the other way and deny their share of the responsibility for the content that appears on their platforms. Because if you run a business, I think if you run a business of any kind, you have a duty to protect your customers. And I believe that this is, I believe this strongly then as Home Secretary, at the time I was 
thinking more about incitement to terrorism or child sexual abuse, but it's just as important now. Although the internet contains, of course, a wealth of helpful content you know, for those that are struggling and those that need support, to many people, you know, especially those that are the most vulnerable in our society, they are also exposed to abhorrent and unacceptable content, especially the kind of content that promotes suicide and self-harm. So I will be convening a roundtable with social media platforms and search engines to encourage them to take more action and the online safety bill that we've already bought before Parliament gives us a once in a generation opportunity to tackle this issue through legislation as well. I will also work jointly across government to look at both upcoming and other current legislation to make sure that it meets the rapidly evolving challenges that we face. Because when it comes to the encouragement of suicide and related harmful behaviour, we are currently relying on legislation that was primarily created long before the digital age. And there is currently no specific offence that covers those who encourage or assist others to self-harm, or in my view, of course, a grave and heinous offence. So we have already announced that we will be creating a new offence of encouraging or assisting self-harm. And I will work with my colleagues to see what else we can do where we are falling short. Our suicide prevention plan will set out more detail on exactly how we're going to do this. We also know that debt and economic uncertainty can be a factor too. We saw from the recession in 2008 that tragically it led to a rise in suicide rates over the following years, especially among men. And I know that people are facing some real uh, strains with the cost of living. It's a huge cost of living challenge right now for so many people. We've protected millions of jobs throughout the pandemic with the furlough scheme and through loans and other incentives. And we're providing economic security where we can during the current time of uh, economic uncertainty. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the suicide rate was mostly remained stable, but despite that, it had a monumental impact on people's lives. But the next few months are critical, and we must do everything in our power to make sure that we support the most vulnerable as they deal with these financial pressures. Our public servants, of course, they have a hugely important role to play here. They interact with many people, uh, where often some of the most vulnerable people in society, and they deal with issues like debt and gambling, which can be major risk factors. So I want to ensure that all, all frontline government employees, government workers who interact with people in these situations have suicide prevention training. And I'm also working, going to be working now with the Speaker of the House of Commons to encourage access to suicide prevention training for all MPs and their staff. I've been hosting surgeries in my own constituency for over 12 years, and often people come, come to see me that they feel they have nowhere else to turn. And as a result, I think it's really important that MPs and their staff, have a, because they have this unique window into the lives of so many people that are in distress in their local areas, that they get this kind of training. And so by helping them to recognise the signs of suicidal behaviour and signpost people to options of support, we can help them to intervene before it's too late. I'm determined to focus not just on those who are at risk of suicide, but of course also their loved ones. The sudden and unexpected circumstances of death from suicide can bring huge trauma. And I know the toll that losing a loved one can take on you. And we need to do better at supporting those people that are left behind. Not only because it is the right thing to do, but because those who are bereaved from suicide are themselves at greater risk of suicide. The evidence suggests that for every suicide, around 135 people are directly affected. And so we need to do everything we can to break this cycle of grief and suffering. Through putting in place, for example, the long-term plan that every local area now has services for suicide bereavement support. And by the end of this year, those services will proactively communicate with bereaved family within days of a death 
to, uh, to offer their support, removing the onus from the bereaved at their time of grief. Third, we must keep improving services to help people who are struggling with their mental health. The NHS is offering care and support to more people with mental health conditions than ever before, with record levels of investment and more comprehensive round the support. After all, your suicidal thoughts don't keep office hours. They are more likely to emerge when people are alone or perhaps late at night. And we hear from charity partners that their helplines are often the busiest in the hours of 9 p.m. to midnight. All mental health providers now have 24-7 urgent mental health helplines in place that together are managing some 200,000 calls each month. My aim is that by 2023-2024, anyone in the country will be able to dial NHS 111 and reach their local mental health support team at any time of day 24-7, which would make England one of the first countries in the world to offer such a service. We're also making greater use of talking therapies, which were pioneered in England and have now been emulated across the world. Over a million people have accessed talking therapy in the past year, and we're expanding this access even further. The vast majority of people that have accessed these therapies, they have done so through self-referral, meaning that they can get the help they need more quickly. And so the median waiting time to start treatment is now only two weeks. But despite this progress, we must keep working to drive up service levels and address any unevenness in the provision across the board. And as part of this, I want to see an improvement in the quality of safety plans. These are practical tools to, to help someone to navigate suicidal feelings and urges. For example, removing objects that can be used for suicide or self-harm. At the moment, there's a stark variation in the standard and quality of these plans. And I'm pleased to announce today that we will be working with experts in the sector to publish some standalone best practice guidance on safety plans, showing what good looks like and how it can save lives. These urgent services work extraordinarily hard to help people at the greatest risk. But sadly, some two thirds of people who take their own life are not in contact with mental health services at all. I was just reminded of this uh, a couple of hours ago when I spoke to a bereaved parent. Of course, we want to get this number down, but it reinforces the importance of the communities that are around us. A report for the Adolescent Mental Health Program finds that, and I quote the report, it says, in cohesive neighborhoods, defined as a place where people know their neighbors, adolescent well-being and mental health are stronger. Now, we all know the power to, to make a positive impact on mental health of people around us, and the answers can often lie with communities where we live. There are two central pillars of my overall NHS reform program that I think are crucial here, and that is prevention and personalization. Our wonderful initiative, so one wonderful initiative that intersects both of these areas is social prescribing, where we draw on all parts of a local community that shape our health and happiness. This work will benefit the whole community, but especially those at risk of suicide, reconnecting those who feel lonely or isolated with the world around them. You know, I talked earlier about how we need to do more to reach middle-aged men who are at greatest risk. Men of that age typically find it harder to build social connections with women. And I've really been inspired by groups like uh, Men in Sheds, which give men a place to meet like-minded people and to share their concerns. Through tailored opportunities for social prescribing and personalized support, we can help those who are traditionally reluctant to come forward and give them the help and support that they need. They have now been almost a million referrals to social prescribing services in this country, with now some record 2,500 social prescribing workers in place, who have all been encouraged to do e-learning on suicide awareness. I've set a target of 4 million people 
uh, to benefit from personalized care like this by March 2024. And I want to get more people into community-led schemes to tackle the social and economic drivers of their distress. And finally, we will make the most of new technologies that help this country, the kind of technologies that help this country through the pandemic. This was a, a time when our mental health system, just like many others across the world, was put under huge strain. But it was also a time that we saw new ways of accessing care that we can take forward now into this next chapter. We must make greater use of apps and online services that can provide new pathways of care and help to give more people the kind of access that they need more quickly. We must apply this approach to data too. During the COVID crisis, our decisions, my decisions, they were underpinned by real-time data in a way we'd never seen before in our health service. And that gave us an up-to-date picture of the situation on the ground. But there are currently too many gaps when it comes to data around suicide prevention. That means we don't currently have a clear picture of certain areas. So for example, any link between suicide and ethnicity. So by bringing data together, we can identify concerning trends and respond at a much faster pace. So we've been working with OHIP, that's the division in my department, the Office for Health Improvements and Disparities, to trial a new national suspected suicide surveillance system. This allows us to look at patterns of risk, like data on new and emerging methods of suicide, and on suicide rates across different population platforms to provide more sophisticated real-time information that will allow us to make better decisions. These trials have already shown to be a great success. I'm pleased to confirm today that we will now be rolling this initiative out nationally and it will be operational from early next year. Last week at London Tech Week, I also launched uh, our new data strategy which shows how we will use the intrinsic value within data to tackle the twin challenges of recovery and reform. I called the strategy, I named it Data Saves Lives. And there are a few greater opportunities to save lives than this vital work on suicide prevention. This issue is deeply personal to me. And I feel a heavy sense of duty to use my time in this role to make a difference. The dark cloud of suicide means that too much potential has gone unfilled and that there are too many families that have been left incomplete. I'm determined to work with you to tackle this source of grief and heartbreak so that fewer people, fewer people get the news that they that will one day perhaps turn their lives upside down. Thank you all very much.